Anyone uh, here last year when I did a TED Talk on, on uh, who have a few people? Okay, I this, the TED Talk last year was basically this, is like being unfaithful to an evidence-based practice really is sin. It was in the Catholic, the recovering Catholic part of me that was coming out <laughs> with all this kind of thing. So I was trying to like really taking a look at this, and why was I taking a look at it? Because for about 10 years, I was the director of evidence-based practice initiatives in New York State. So that was like my thing, right? And I was promoting it around New York State. This is primarily for adults with serious mental health sorts of problems. And that experience has kind of led me to this topic of the evidence-based practitioner, because I really do think we need to get to, to that. So what does that really mean? Uh, this slide is like pretty important, because evidence-based practices in many ways is in that research evidence circle. Make some sense? But you know what, if that's just what we got, we're not going to get very far because as it turns out, good quality practices, you all, like the practitioner's experience and their skill seems to matter. Pretty important. And as it turns out, the client's uh, experience, their preferences, their particular cultural perspective, beliefs, as it turns out, that seems to matter too. Because if you don't do that, if you don't engage the client effectively, you may get one of these. Uh, do you guys have this in wherever your state you're from? I'm from New York. We do this. So all of your wonderful practices, you know, the millions of dollars it takes to you know, build new medications, all the wonderful training can be reduced to zero if the client gives you one of this. Yes? So getting the client not to give you one of those is kind of important. All right? And that's really what I'm going to be talking about. And it's sort of like going back to the future in a way because I think the, the pendulum is sort of like swan. And I was one of the big promoters of that pendulum. I went around New York State, and I was like pretty good at kind of building people's awareness around evidence-based practice, why it's like sort of important. So I was over there. But when I was first trained, the whole business had to do with the relationship. It was all about the relationship. So what are the qualities? What are some of the behaviors, the practices? And people took it like real seriously. So there's a number of things that really occurred in my life that sort of contributed to sort of this evolution in my thinking because I was, I was trained as a behavior therapist. I used to train actually pigeons and stuff undergraduate. I, it was for the birds, I gotta tell you. Uh, no, I'm only kidding, I'm only kidding. So, you know, I was had like, and I really did wanna have like some real hard stuff to like do. Uh, I'm just gonna, you know, I'm gonna go to this slide. This isn't really me and my mom, but it, the story has to do with my mom and I. So I'm from Sicily and my family's from Sicily and Sicily psychology is not so big. In my little hometown in, in Sicily, they don't speak very much about it. So I had to explain to my mom what I was doing. So she would say something to me like, Anthony, what is this thing called psychology? What do you do? So I said, uh, Ma, you know, what I do is I, you know, I talk to people you know, about their problems and you know, try to help them through. She quizzically, she says, yes, but what do you do for these people? <laughs> so it's like, what the heck? How am I going to explain? I said, Ma. I'm kind of like a priest who could get married. She says, oh, that's a nice, that's a nice. <laughs> so basically, if you would ask my mom, what is a son do? She says, well, he's like a priest, but I have grandchildren. You know, that kind of thing, I could have grandchildren. So that was like, I was like really, really, what the heck do I do? Like, I'm a talker, basically, I'm like a big talker. That's what I do, I have no syringe, I have no pills to give anybody. I'm a big talker. And really, I ought to be really great at it. Not just pretty good, because ultimately, that's the tool. Me, I am the, like sort of the instrument, right, of the treatment. So, well, that's pretty important. I better be the best communicator, the best talker in town. So that's, that's one issue. The other is when I think of the project with uh, Dartmouth and SAMHSA around promoting evidence-based practices, a number of states were involved in that. When we got together for a meeting, everyone had sort of the same feedback. There's an assumption that all the practitioners have those core foundational skills upon which you can build those evidence-based practices. So they said, you know what, I think that has to be revisited, that assumption. So that was one. The other is just reflecting on many years I worked in inpatient, outpatient hospitals in New York State. And when I step back and I say, okay, if I've ever had any positive outcomes, what was the bottom line? What was that attributed to? Maybe I had a wonderful technique. I had a wonderful kind of strategy. But it always came back to me like, no. It really had a lot to do with the quality of the relationship that I had built up with this patient. I don't know if that resonates with you guys, but when I really honestly take a look at it, now, of course, some of the things that I did and some of the strategies uh, were, were helpful, they were effective, but in the absence of that strong foundational trust in me as a practitioner, I don't think it was going to go 
you know, like anywhere. The other contributing uh, learning was through trauma-informed care. And so I've been hearing a lot and learning a lot about the power of a healing relationship. And I said, you know, we've got to really get back to that. The conversation about protocols and you know, evidence-based practices that we can kind of take off the shelf, or if we just follow these, this kind of like formula, those are things that, I, many of those things are absolutely useful, very important to improve quality. But in the absence of that type of strong relationship, I just don't think we're really gonna get very far. So I want to swim, uh, the, the notion of a foundation, if we have the foundations kind of weak, then everything else that we lay upon that is gonna be weak as well. So we need a strong, we really do need a very, very strong foundation. So what do we need to be able to do? How about like listening really effectively? Is that like an easy thing to do? What people say of mental health practitioners, I can't believe it, those people. The social workers, psychologists, nurses, psychiatrists, they're the most unbelievable listeners I've ever seen. Was that what people would say in our experience of each other? We say, we are the most, we are unbelievable. We not only know how to listen so well, that we can demonstrate, empathically reflect the meaning, the content, the feelings that other people experience. So that's like not just a nice thing to have, but it's a critical th thing to have, and it's a skillful thing to have. And so I think there's a lot of like assumptions, and I would make a lot of assumptions. You know, just be a nice person, listen to the person. I used to be a high school teacher. And a high school teacher, my, you know, I had students, they were very good at this. Um, I would be teaching, and they had like two very important techniques to kind of demonstrate to me that they were listening. So I had the head nodders. You know the head nodders? You know, the kids, they're not in the head, and they're not paying attention. They're completely disassociated and daydreaming about something else. You know, like this. So you have the, and then you have the ones who use the technique of the staring. They thought, like, intensity of eye gaze was going to be, you know, sort of like, hey, I'm really listening to you. But really, there was, like, nothing hardly going on. And I know that I've hardly ever checked out with my clients how they understood the encounter that we had. Because we never go, like, after 15 minutes, go to the client and say, hey, listen, Joey, just for a second here. What do you think we talked about? What do, you, what do you think? I'm telling you, I think we get a big surprise. I think we get a big surprise of what actually is it that folks actually take from that sort of experience. So I think we have to be much more systematic, more thoughtful about those very, very basic. And here's just sort of an example of listening is really an entire human process, right? And that that's important. And I kind of bring this back to Carl Rogers, who I kind of remember studying like in the... But I hardly ever talk, think, thought about the guy. You don't hear his name. He'll never be at a conference. I think he's dead, though. But it's, uh, anyway, but you know, it's like... But that, he, he was like really important in my early, kind of early days. So this quote, I think, is really important. We think we listen. Everybody. If I ever went to one uh, practitioner and said, do you think you listen? I'm, I don't think there's not one who said, eh, not really. Uh, not really. I mean, I'm there. I kind of like say, hey, how are you doing? And that's about it. I don't think there's any practitioner who says, I'm not a great listener. Right? If he has to say the clients, I don't know if they'd have the same sort of reflection on this, right? So, but it's very rare that, to listen with real understanding and true empathy. And yet listening of this kind is very special and maybe one of the most important forces for change that I know. And I'm kind of like, I'm thinking more like that these days that that's really what we need to do. That's what we need to in terms of development of the workforce, the capacity to really listen, to make that kind of a connection. And it's not so easy, right, for folks who are least suffering, for folks who find that social encounter not so easy, particularly around the area like trauma. And I'm hearing a lot from people when they talk about their recovery stories about their lives. I, it's not like, you know, I went through this specific type of treatment. It's, it's kind of like I met this wonderful psychiatrist who really treated me like an adult and, and kind of communicated to me confidence that I could really move forward. It's those kinds of stories, so it's always about like human stories again. So that's sort of, again, influencing my, my thinking. Now, you guys have been, uh, when I do some training, motivation uh, interviewing, uh, Miller and Rolnick, the architects of, of that, they would absolutely throw me out of town if they saw my presentation, M but maybe not. I have just two slides when I do training on motivational interview. Oh, you're supposed to have like two days training. I do two slides. Then what the heck is the slide? And the slide basically comes down to, tell me, one slide is, tell me everything you can do to piss off a client, to irritate a client, to turn them off. And you just make the big list, right? Could you, can you make that list? I think we can make the list. So let's say you have 20 things on the list. These are the ways you irritate and turn off a client. The next slide, don't do that. There you go, motivational interviewing in a nutshell. 
All right, so pretty much that's where I'm at with that. Kind of like, just don't do that. Okay, so this, this whole area, and but some folks would like us to think of motivational interviewing as a practice again. We have this thing, we got to put it on the practice thing. But when I look at it, I don't think it's so much a practice as it is some of those core foundational relationship building. Even Miller and Rolnick will say this. It's not a series, te- a series of techniques. They really didn't want people to think of it as like a technique, like a behavioral you know, equivalent of like a pill, uh, but a way of being with clients. And another statement, whenever you're in doubt, when you don't know what the hell to do, their suggestion is just listen. So I, I think that that's, again, you know, an important thing. We have this tendency to try to, if it's not on the list of evidence-based practices, it ain't good stuff. I was so happy when evidence-based practices came out that empathy was still in. I was so happy. I was because I was worried. I said, they're going to get rid of it or what? <laughs> Thank God. Apparently it's okay. So, now, have you guys ever heard of this thing? Anybody know what this is? Anosognosia? It's basically kind of like a neurological problem where there's a lot of clients with serious mental health problems who don't really recognize that they have a problem. You ever encounter, encounter that kind of thing? So now what the hell am I supposed to do? I can't bring in like an evidence person says, I don't have a problem. What the hell am I supposed to do? Well, there are folks who actually took this on, like people, uh, Javier uh, Amador, who's take, taking this on, who's saying, you know what you got to do? You got to like listen. You got to be empathic. You got to identify areas of agreement and you need to partner. Why? Because you can build up a sense of trust. Don't feel hopeless or helpless if the client says, eh, Dr. Salerno, you're a nice guy, but I don't have a problem. Like, I don't know where to go with that. We're, you know, we're kind of stumped, aren't we, a little bit? Right? But the notion of those core skills of listening, of empathically responding, can engage individuals in a level of trust where they're willing to try things that are even inconsistent with what their current experience is like because they have so much trust and confidence in you to take those types of like risks. Now, the other thing we do is we impart information. Do you guys impart information? Do clinicians impart information? We impart it all the time. Lord knows what happens with that information. Because we not necessarily know how, how people process it. You know, when you have serious mental health problems, you know one of the channels that's most compromised for people with serious mental health problems? It's called auditory uh, information processing. That means like through conversation. You know, I did so much treatment that was conversation. When you think of it, I'm like paid for conversation. Now, I hope it's really good conversation and really special conversation. But that's the tool. The treatment is always us. It's not the manual. I worked on it. I developed curricula, all this kind of stuff. It's just really important is that is the treatment is not, it's not the practice per se. It's you. Does that make sense? I hope it makes sense to folks because it's making more and more sense to me. So how do we impart information? Well, I just tell people stuff. It's a skillful practice to impart information. How do I impart it? What if the person is very stressed out? You know what happens to people you're stressed out? They don't hear a damn thing you're saying. That's just us. It's kind of like part of the human nature, right? If you're really anxious, really worried, it's like it goes, or misunderstood, and it goes over your head. So we have to understand, how do we create an environment where people are very calm, where they're ready, that they're open, right? And then how do we check out that they get the information? Do we give them some follow-up information they could take with them? You know, all of these things that really, you know, I, there was a time I was, I was a teacher. I was a high school teacher. I, too bad. I'm going to go to this slide because I have five minutes left. I want to just say quickly that besides being really good in part of information, we ought to be unbelievable problem solvers. We ought, to be, we ought to know how to engage people in problem solving. We ought to also help people know how to make informed decisions. That would be not bad, right? We ought to be very skillful. We ought to be the best on the planet when it comes to helping people. We ought to know how to mobilize resources because we can't do it by ourselves. That's a skillful set of behaviors. And then we also have, have to know how to advocate for clients. And I think that those core foundational skills is really where we need to go. I was saying I was a, te- I was a teacher, high school teacher in Lower East Side of Manhattan. And that's, I, I was a teacher, and then I was getting my, my degree at, uh, at NYU. <clears throat> Soon as I became a psychotherapist, I took off the hat of being a teacher, and I was now a psychotherapist, right? And I left the idea that my work was around teaching. It was no, it was some other thing. I had to kind of help people go through a process of like discovery or whatever it might be. I really was very confused. I really was, I have to tell you. I was like, just, just, just. but my mom would have been even, thank God I knew the uh, priest analogy. Otherwise, it had been really like very confused because it made no sense to her whatsoever. You know, I said, you don't give nobody pills? I said, no, mom, I don't. Injection? No, no, mom, like this. Do anything good for them. So it was like, 
it was like really sort of a, a challenge, still to this day. All right? So, this is like, so the psychotherapists teach a kind of dichotomy. So I went to work, Harlem Valley Psychiatric Center, outpatient program, and I said, now I have to be a therapist. And I left all the learning knowledge and, and teaching, and I think I made a big mistake. Because I think that that's one of the most important things that we do. The work is around helping people to learn, learn some special things. And the whole area of teaching, I think, is not just like a side issue. You just, nobody has to get trained in that, right, in mental health work. But I think we need to really look at that. You know, how do we help individuals to, you know, to keep and strengthen the skills they have, to stop doing some stuff that's kind of getting in the way, and to begin to learn how to manage these very serious mental health, substance use, health care types of problems. And there's different ways, of course, of learning. I want to end with just one little story. Dr. Margulies is a colleague of mine. He and I are taking trips to do some consulting at Delaware Psych Center, so from New York. And on these trips, he was telling me his story when he was, um, under, he was in graduate school, and he was working with a, a person in a clinic in, uh, in uh, Nassau County. And he says, Tony, I've got to tell you this, this thing that was going on. He said, I worked with this, this young man for about two years, diagnosed with schizophrenia. And I had done all the good stuff that I could find. You know, like I did family work, I did social skills training, I did psychoeducation, I did relaxation training, did stress management, did all these things. So for two years, this client did very, very well. Did really well, didn't go back into hospital, didn't have any emergency use, was really quite stable. Paul felt very proud. So he goes to the client at the end, like he did with all of his clients, says, you know, Joe, where, you know, my uh, work here is, is ending and I'm gonna be moving on. He says, um, can we reflect on the last two years? What was the best thing? What really helped? Remember, we did the family work. We did the social skill training. The guy didn't miss it. He said, oh, I know. Oh, he says, yeah. So what was most helpful? He says, oh, you know, every time you came into the waiting room, you shook my hand. And Paul says, I think that we have to learn how to figure out so that, and that was just a, and the symbolic for the way you treated me, our relationship. Dr. Margulies, that's really what it was all about. Not that those other things were, didn't help, but they would have had little value in, without the context of this respectful relationship. And I think uh, the idea that I would like to spread is to move a little bit more towards looking at the evidence-based practitioner rather than just the evidence-based practice. Thank you very much, folks. I'm going to introduce Dr. Covington in just a second. Working? Yeah. Okay. So my timekeeper's back there. How are we doing? Perfect? Okay. We have a two-minute transition period. Um, Dr. Covington, uh, just a few things. I mean, there's, a, there's, a, there's so much to say about Dr. Covington, but I'm just going to highlight two issues. One, the CEO and president of Crisis Access, and he's just really devoted so much of his career and has been serving on, on so many national committees, just taking a hard look at this whole area of suicide prevention. And his topic, everything we knew about suicide was wrong, I'm sure everyone's on the edge of their seat, like, tell us how it was wrong. So please, have us all welcome uh, Dr. Covington. Perfect, super. Uh, caring, engaging, listening, thank you, Tony. Wonderful, right? Uh, sometimes we already know everything we need to know if we go back to the basics, and sometimes we don't. Everything I knew about suicide was wrong. After multiple trips down the hallway with a bucket to the tub, filling it with ice, it was finally full. And I turned on the cold water and brought it all the way up to the top. Now just a couple of hours earlier, I had finished my first marathon in Central Park in New York. And I'd finished just 15 minutes north of three hours. And my friend Michael and I 
I, we were thinking about the cramps that we had had in the last miles and how much pain we were in. And we decided we were going to recuperate like the pros do. They take an ice bath. So I got in that tub and I immersed myself in that water all the way up to my neck. Oh my God. You know, I normally try to avoid cold water. I don't know what I was thinking. And I can't tell you today exactly what I felt, but the kind of the sense of sheer terror that I was not going to be able to get out of that water fast enough. Now what happens when you receive and experience acute pain? The first thing is a physiological response. The eyes dilate, the, the pupils dilate, the eyelids widen, your heart rate spikes, your blood pressure goes up, your breathing quickens, you're immediately into a, a, a primal sort of reaction to get out of that water. It was amazing how quickly that all occurred. Now, I was at the American Association of Suicidology Conference last year. And I was talking to a friend of mine about the relative absence of individuals there who were suicide attempt survivors. And I said to him, that's so incongruous to me. It would be like being at the American Association of Cancer, American Cancer Association, and there not being any cancer survivors there. It, it doesn't seem to make sense. And he said, you can't compare those two because no one chooses cancer. And I thought about that and the way that we think about suicide, where we look at it so differently. Now, I think maybe all of us at one time or another have thought about suicide in this way. And yet, I don't think it's the best frame. I'm not even sure it's accurate. William Styron was one of our top American authors. How many of you heard Merrill Hemingway earlier today talk about another top author? Uh, William Styron wrote A Darkness Visible. How many of you have actually read it? Oh my gosh. I encourage you to look at his, his striving. This is one of our top talents. And he says, I don't know how to get across... For those of you who haven't been through debilitating, crippling suicidal depression, I don't know how to explain your ebbs and flows in life, your ups and downs, your disappointments, and they, I, they just, I can't get across to you that they are not something that will help you to get what this is. This was one of the things he wrote. Depression is a disorder of mood so mysteriously painful and elusive in the way it becomes known to the self, to the mediating intellect, as to verge close to being beyond description. It thus remains nearly incomprehensible to those who have not experienced it in its extreme mode. The best metaphor he thought he could come up with to describe it was physical anguish. Pain. Now, when I was in that bathtub, the first thing that I did once that terror came through me is I, my friend Michael brought me a little, one of those little whiteboards. I was still in the tub, and we began flow charting out the pros and cons <laughs> of getting out of the water, beginning to think through a plan of how I would, you don't, you're not buying this? And at some point, about 15 minutes later, Michael asked me, have you ever had thoughts of getting out of this tub? <laughs> and that was the first time that I had thought about that. You know, actually, when we, at, when we some of us still, some of us, not, not in this room, but some of us in the field still hold on to this idea, I, I want to be careful about bringing up an idea that somebody might not have had and triggering something that they would do. 
that concept for someone who has been in that bathtub up to here is, um, is patronizing. It's, it's condescending. It's impossible for that. It drives them nuts <laughs> that you can't understand that when I was in that tub, the, every neural pathway of my mind was get out of the water. I didn't choose to get out of that water. I thrashed and broke and flew and got out of that tub the instant I realized, I, I don't know if I'm going to, literally, I'm not making this up, I don't know if I can survive being in this, I'll be in this bathtub too long. I had to get out. Now, do people choose to die by suicide? Or rather... Do they, in fact, hold on and choose everything they can to survive until every last strength, support, coping skill, and hope is gone? And if that was the case, what difference would it make for those of us in this room? I was on Fear Factor last year. How many of you used to watch that show where they ate the, you know, the cockroaches who are still alive? And the first thing we did, and I, I was so excited, there were six of us selected, and uh, I thought, wow, uh, I, you know, this is the best day of my life that this, you know, 40, 40 something year old person got in with these kids. And uh, the very first thing was they uh, suspended us. There was a, a, a platform, and we were 40 feet above about 1,000 people. And we were holding on to a bar that was shaped like a Y turning down. And it was simple. Whoever fell first and whoever fell second was eliminated. And I thought, I looked at my competition and uh, I knew I could, I, there was no way that I was going to fall first, second, third, fourth, or fifth until that platform fell out from under my feet. And immediately, my hands started slipping. I, I was one minute into this fear factor. I'd beaten out 30 people to be chosen. I was so excited about it. And now I'm in, I don't want to be here because I'm going to be the first one to be eliminated. And I began thinking of every coping skill I could come up with to hold on to that bar. And the pain began to intensify. And my palms began to sweat. And my mind began to, it was really an unbearable sort of thing. And I began to say, how can I cope? Where can I go? What beach have I been to that will help me for the next few seconds? And eventually it was literally, hold on one more second, one more second, just one more second. I chose to hold on to that bar and hold on to that bar and hold on to that bar and what happened? Eventually, everyone suspended with gravity and the pain is going to eventually pull you down. No one can survive that forever. Now I eventually, I looked and I saw the first person fall and then I knew I was done. I, I, I couldn't. And I kept, kept holding on, kept choosing to hold on, and I fell. Now, I never choose to fall. I, 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 I only chose to hold on. And I used everything at my disposal until I fell. Now, I fell, literally, as I, I thought I was eliminated. And they showed the video up on the screen. And I had fallen almost precisely at the same time as another individual but they fell first, and I advanced. Now, I say that because holding on long enough is a pretty important thing. Now, how do we do that? I've been asking this question in presentations for some time, and it stirs people up. They don't like it. I mean, we all, I think, used to believe A. We all believe suicide can be prevented. We all believe that. It can be prevented except when it can't, which is A. It can be prevented except in those cases when it can't. Never in those truly intent on suicide, those who choose suicide, they're going to do it, we can't stop them. I'll offer a second one, B. Sometimes 
but only in advance of acute risk. I've been watching uh, kind of some national key leaders in, re related to the Defense Department and others, and I'm watching them move. They were A, they're B, some of them are now C. They're, they're, the, sh the thinking is shifting. It's not shifting because of me or other researchers or crisis center directors or suicide prevention people. It's shifting because of the voices of people who've been in the bathtub and made attempts that they should have died from but survived. And they've told us about this experience of holding on and holding on till they cannot hold on any longer. C, always, but only in advance of acute risk. A B is sometimes. What we believe now is D. Suicide can be prevented always, even up to the last moment. We have a built-in security system as human beings that fights against any threat. Our bodies do that. Our minds do that. We work and fight and choose to hold on until the pain doesn't allow it anymore. Now, a year ago, I had the privilege of presenting with General Mark Graham, a retired Major General Mark Graham and his wife Carol. They had two sons to die within seven months of each, uh, of each other, both in the military, Kevin and Jeff. One died... Uh, when an IED hit his unit in Iraq, and the other died when he was taken by suicide. And, you know, I expect a certain amount of strength from military leaders, but for those of you who haven't, and he's here at this conference, uh, the, the courage exhibited by this, this couple uh, in the vulnerability that they share in talking about their story to me is... Uh, courage to the 10th power. Um, but you know, he doesn't, uh, the, the, the story that he tells is about Rabbi Kushner's book, Why Bad Things Happen to Good People. And in that book, he talks about a psychological experiment where individuals were put in a room and their feet, they put their feet in a tub of ice water. Now, individuals can only hold their feet in there for so long before they can choose and choose and choose and choose to keep them in there. But those feet are coming out. They will take an action and pull those feet out. It's a primal reaction. It's not a, it's not a conscious decision. It's, they're coming out. They then repeated the, the exercise, but instead of the person being in the room by themselves... They simply put another individual in the room and did the same thing. What difference does that make? Is it going to matter, Tony, if somebody's in there? What do you think? Rabbi Kushner's conclusion, the mere presence of another individual doubled the time that someone could keep their feet in that ice water. Our ability to save lives and engage starts with listening and caring and hope. But at the end of the day, the sheer presence and belief, if they can hold on just long enough, what we know from research that goes back 30 years now, is individuals pulled off the Golden Gate Bridge. We always believed they would go somewhere else and do something different. They would find a way to end their lives. It's not true. The data doesn't prove that at all. It proves exactly the opposite. Survivors survive. 19 and 20 go on to live lives where they survive and some of them thrive. Can we help them hold on? Can we be there with them? Can we stop distancing ourselves from this through concepts like this isn't like cancer? My friend said, this isn't like cancer. People choose cancer. I said, tell me about that. And they don't choose cancer. He said, cancer sneaks up on you and it, it finds its way in. And then it begins to spread. And you will fight it. Your organs will fight it. You'll fight it. You'll get treatment. You do everything you can. And you will struggle and hold on and hold on. And if, you, if, if you're not successful, it will take you. 
We, many of us, have decided and determined we won't use the word committed suicide any longer. It doesn't seem appropriate for individuals who gave their all to survive and did it. Maybe we should start thinking about that related to the issue of choice. You know, I haven't heard Major General Mark Graham talk about someone choosing to die by suicide. I've heard him talking about being with individuals and helping them hold on. Let's all see if we can't do the same. Thank you. Very good on time, so don't have to rush so much. Okay, thanks so much, Dr. Covington. Again, you know, the whole point of TED Talks is ideas worth spreading. A very important idea that worth, worth spreading. Um, now our third uh, distinguished speaker is Dr. Arthur C. Evans, uh, who is a uh, <clears throat> his topic on behavioral health, a transferable technology for the real world problems. Just a couple of uh, bullet points about Dr. Uh, Evans. He, he's the commissioner of Philadelphia Department of Behavioral Health and Intellectual Disabilities. And he's been very much involved in the transformation of the entire system that focuses on recovery and resilience in adults and children. He's a clinical and community psychologist and really involved in numerous national committees that's focused on improving behavioral health care. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ev uh, Dr. Evans. Good afternoon. So when I was in <coughs> college, I fell in love with computers. And back then, computers were these big mainframe machines that were in rooms that most of us didn't have access to. And we had to use punch card machines to actually type programs. Now, I know I just dated myself. <laughs> um, but they were kind of mysterious. They were locked off from every place else and only a few people had access to them. In order to improve computer power, the way to do that was to build bigger computers and faster computers, because that was a paradigm. It's a mainframe paradigm. And then around the 80s, people like Steve Wozniak, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, they came on the scene and they said, you know what? The way you really get power out of computers is to put them in the hands of people uh, so that they can be used by people. And that represented a major shift in the paradigm in this country and the way we think about computing. And so we went from a place-based way of thinking about computing to a person-based way of thinking about computing. And so I've often wondered, what if we in behavioral health had a similar transformation? Because if you think about it, what we have in our field is a mainframe paradigm for what we do. And that mainframe is treatment. I call it the treatment black box. And so I've wondered about what would it be like if we were to have a similar transformation where we started to think about what we do in terms of the knowledge, the technologies that we have, and putting that in the hands of people. So let's sort of take a little trip through uh, history. So not only did the move to personal computers happen, so that computers were in our homes and in our offices, but the technology continued to advance so that we've put computer chips in practically everything. How many of you have a smartphone? All right, just take your smartphone out for a second. 
So computer chips are everywhere. They're in our phones, they're in our cars, they're in our thermostats, uh, they're even on our babies. And we've seen a huge revolution in lots of industries because we have taken the computer technology and uh, used it in not lots of novel ways. So this is a hemodialysis machine that was in the 50s. Um, and this is a chip that is on a contact lens that measures glucose. So really radicalized our uh, lives. So let's look at uh, psychotherapy. So this is the way psychotherapy looked in the 50s. This is the way psychotherapy looks today. So you could say that our technology evolved from this to this. <laughs> so about now you're probably thinking, well, what did the presenter look like <laughs> in the 80s? I don't have to do an after picture because I'm here. <laughs> and I did marry her, just in case you, you're wondering. That's my wife. So here's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about uh, get you to start thinking about uh, how do we change our, our paradigm? And so the first question you might have is, well, okay, so well, why should we change our paradigm? Don't, aren't we really good at what we do? And yeah, we're really good at what we do. We are as good as most healthcare um, specialties that treat people who have chronic illnesses. You know, we're as good or better. But the reality is we have some challenges, right? So one of the challenges we have is that we miss a lot of people who have behavioral health conditions. Half the people who have mental health conditions will come into treatment, and only about a tenth of the people who have a substance use disorder. So what that means is that the majority of people who have behavioral health challenges aren't going to come into treatment. And so if our paradigm is a mainframe paradigm of treatment, we're missing a whole lot of people that we could help. Everybody with me so far? I'm Baptist. You've got to talk back. <laughs> the second problem is this, that the issues of behavioral health really emerge in communities, right? They emerge out in the community. And if all the treatment professionals are behind the walls of treatment programs, we don't have the ability to really detect and then intervene because those issues are happening out there in the community. And I see that every day. I'm a commissioner in a city government. And I get calls from the usual cast of characters, people who are in child welfare and uh, criminal justice, but I also get calls from the licensing and inspection commissioner, the library commissioner, the commerce commissioner. Why? Because they're seeing behavioral health issues even in those areas that we don't think about. Those issues are happening out there. And you know, this idea that we have to go beyond just us, those of us who are the professionals, um, other areas have gotten uh, a hold of this idea. If you think about what's happened in the intelligence community. So if you flew here or if you took a train here, you probably saw or heard an announcement that said, if you see something, say something. And the reason you see that is the intelligence community figured out that if they were the only ones looking for the bad guys, they were going to miss a lot of bad guys, right? And so if we're the only ones who can detect when people are having behavioral health ch challenges, we're going to miss a lot of people. So we have to enlist more people into our field. That's the second reason. Um, the third reason is that even though I think we're pretty good at what we do, we are not getting the outcomes that we need. And so you heard earlier that we haven't bent the curve on a lot of areas that at this point in our development, we really should have bent the curve around. And so part of the problem is that we have an acute care model for treating people in a chronic condition. And there are whole lots of issues with that. So we have to figure out how do we elongate our contact and the support that people can get. And if everything revolves around treatment, we're not going to be able to do that. And so those are some reasons why we have to think about 
uh, moving beyond the treatment black box and enlisting more people to help us in terms of addressing behavioral health issues in, in our community. So then, what does that re then require? So I think that requires a few things. One of them is it requires us to redefine our role. So most often what I see in our field is that we define ourselves by what we do. So I love mission statements that say something like, our mission is to provide high quality, great services. I think my mission is to help people to get better, to have health. When we reframe what we do in that way, it opens up our minds to all kinds of ways that we can work with people. So it's not just psychotherapy and medication, there are all kinds of ways that we can begin to work with people if we redefine ourselves not as therapists or prescribers, but as behavioral health professionals that can help intervene in lots of different ways, in lots of different settings, and with lots of different people. Second issue is this, that not only do we have to redefine ourselves, we have to redefine who, we, who it is that we work with. Because how many of you are clinicians? Show of hands. Okay, so most of us who are clinicians train to work with people who have a diagnosis. Well, there are a couple of problems with that. The first problem is that people who experience mental health issues often, particularly people who have severe mental illnesses, you know that those, those symptoms emerge over a long period of time. And so if we have to wait until a person crosses that threshold, we've missed a lot of opportunities to work with folks. That's the first problem. We don't intervene early because we're waiting for people to get into that category with which we can work with folks. Second issue is this. If the only people that we're working with who are, are people who have a diagnosis, that's about a quarter of the population, a little more than a quarter of the population, three quarters of the population are people that we're not working with. And the question is, do they have behavioral health issues? The answer is yes, because we know, and this audience would know, that behavioral health issues happen on a continuum and they're not this categorical thing. Now, as a field, we recognize that really quickly on 9-11. Because if you were in the field on 9-11, you instantly knew that your role was not just to work with people who had a diagnosis, but you knew all kinds of people in our communities were gonna have, uh, have issues and challenges. And so we were talking to the media, right, about how they should frame messages. We were talking to teachers about how they should work with children and parents. We were working with people who were first responders and we were doing that in a way that was very natural and we didn't question uh, that that wasn't our role and that wasn't the population that we needed to work with. And so we need to redefine um, who it is that we work with because if we really want to be a, a healthcare player, one of the things we have to do is to think about how do we keep people psychologically healthy and not just uh, focus on pathology and illness. And then the third thing is that we need to think about uh, a wider range of tools in our toolbox. It's because right now, most of what we do is psychotherapy and medication. And so if we want to be in communities, if we want to do the kinds of things where we can help organizations and institutions be more effective, we're gonna to have to move beyond our comfort zone of, of psychotherapy and, and medication. So what I would say is that we have to do what the computer industry has done. They've made their technology so accessible that you could be two or 82 the technology is uh, that accessible to use. And so the question for us is, um, how do we use, how do we take what we do as behavioral health professionals, make it accessible, and put it in the hands of uh, not only ourselves, but this broader community, and enlist the broader community to help us with behavioral health issues. So I wanna leave you with a couple of examples, um, one from Philadelphia, and then one more of a national. So, in Philadelphia, one of the things that we're doing is, a, is we're using technology to uh, do online screening. And so we've been doing it for the last couple of years. We screened about 
2,000 people have, uh, have gone online. We have this new website. Uh, you can not only at this website uh, get online screening, but also uh, mental health first aid and other kinds of uh, community resources. Um, and what the research shows is that 80% of the people who screen positive will actually follow up with treatment. So what we're doing is getting to a whole group of people who will never walk through our treatment doors, who feel very comfortable um, going online, taking 10 minutes to do a screen, uh, and then getting those people connected to uh, services. But what's really exciting is that at the same time we're doing this, we're also doing a pilot with online psychotherapy. And uh, this is something that's being done in Europe and has a strong evidence base. And so at some point, what we want to be able to do is for, have the ability for people to go online, do a screen, and then do a course of online therapy with a coach. Uh, and that person would never have to come through our treatment doors. So it's one way that we're trying to think differently and reframe how we can help people. Another area is, oh, and I should say that um, we just, the city just got at one a uh, design challenge, and we're going to be taking that technology and embedding it in a retail uh, pharmacy. And uh, next to the blood pressure cuff, you will have a, an iPad with a online screen. So we're trying to normalize it and get that technology out in the places where people can use it. Another area where I think we have some great opportunities are apps. And one of the reasons I ask you to hold up your, your smartphones, this is probably the only time you'll be asked to take out your smartphone at a presentation, so get it out of your system. Do it now. <laughs> okay. um, because if, even though most of our smartphones look pretty similar, if I went to any one of those, it would be really tailored to each one of us. And so we've used apps as a way of using that platform to design uh, a tool that's really unique and helpful to each one of us. And so all kinds of people have uh, some really great apps. SAMHSA has an app. The researchers and clinicians who've developed apps. But here's the thing, and here's one of the reasons that I think we ought to be thinking about how we get into this space. This is something I saw on... Uh, online as I was doing some research for this. Uh, and this is a description of schizophrenia by this person. Schizophrenia has plagued our systems for many years. Today, mental health experts are finding more cases of schizophrenia than they counted in the past. Schizophrenia is nothing to play with, and anyone ignoring this diagnosis is only throwing fuel to the fire, and it goes on from there. That's out there, folks. And um, what's even scarier, is this is the review, right? Five stars, I just, it just scratched the surface, but for the price, I'm impressed at how insightful and succinct uh, this information is, and it goes on from there. Now, there's sort of good news, bad news. So the bad news, obviously, is that this person obviously doesn't know what they're talking about. Uh, the good news is this is the only one, and I think it's the person's mother. So um, <laughs> there, there may be hope here that uh, maybe this isn't getting to the masses. Uh, and by the way, it's on sale for 99 cents from 16.99. Just in case you're wondering, <laughs> scary. Uh, so here's my point. I think we have uh, a tremendous opportunity to rethink and reframe uh, what we do, um, and to move from this idea of a mainframe way of thinking about what we do. Most often, whenever there's a problem, uh, in some of the recent uh, cases where people who may have had mental illness were involved in uh, some situations, people always say, uh, what we need is more treatment. And in fact, there's a debate raging now about, should we coerce people into treatment? Then I would argue that that's not the right argument. That is a mainframe solution for a mobile app problem. Because the real problem is, how do we get to people sooner? How do we create more people and put our technology and information in the hands of people so that we have more people working with us? One of the great opportunities uh, with doing that is what you see with all of the proliferation of apps is you have sort of this natural crowdsourcing, right? We put the technology in people's hands, and then people come up with all kinds of innovative, novel solutions. 
Think about if we could take behavioral health knowledge, behavioral health technologies, put it in the hands of the general public, and what kinds of solutions people could come up with. And so I want to leave you with uh, this quote from uh, MLK, who said that one of our great liabilities of history is that, uh, that all too many people fail to remain awake through great periods of social change. Every society has its protectors of the status quo and its fraternities of the indifferent who are notorious for sleeping through revolutions. Today, our very survival depends on our ability to stay awake, to adjust to new ideas, to remain vigilant, and to face the challenge of change. And so my challenge to us in the field is it's really time to change, to make sure that we are meeting the needs of all of the people in our communities who need our help and all the people who can benefit from our expertise. Thank you. Okay, please just join me again in, in uh, applauding our two distinguished speakers and me. <laughs> um, these TED Talk formats, good? Good stuff? Okay, please in your comments and evaluations, if you feel strongly about that, you put that out there, we take it seriously. We may have 20 TED Talks at the next co National Council Conference. Bye bye everyone. Thanks so much, okay, that was great, that good. was terrific. Thank you so much, Dr. Evans. Thank you. Thank you.